outdoor space. Um, and here's the before. Here's the before from um, the front door. You can see, obviously, this is in the midst of construction, the neighborhood. And this is coming up the steps to the front door. So we decided to, uh, after we stained the floor and railings, uh, we decided to add this elegant, simple uh, fiberglass container to enclose the space. And what we came up with was a stunning year round um, uh, plant composition and a little outdoor room that's both private and open. One of my favorite design challenges is to find unrealized living spaces. It's like free real estate. Um, so here's a, another glimpse into this little seating area. And now she gathers here with her neighbors for cocktails and coffee. So this planter gets, can, uh, gets planted every season. She actually does her own fall plantings because she really loves that. But we do this uh, spring, summer and, and winter planting. So there's always a different collection of plants uh, here in this container. This is actually a summer, summer example. Marty, what were those wiggly things in there? Uh, gl the glass pieces. Okay. Those actually belonged to the homeowner when she moved in. So she has those in several colors and we've used them throughout her containers, uh, depending on the color scheme of the um, plant material. But aren't those lovely? I think it's an, well, I mean, you can see it's like Chihuly kind of inspired um, glass work. It's lovely though, isn't it? Beautiful. Mm -hmm. This is another season. I think this may have been last year's uh, summer collection. I absolutely am in love with texture and shape and color. And uh, you can see that here. These are, um, this is the winter composition from last year. So same, same container. And this is the front. Wow. Now, mm -hmm. yes, it's very beautiful. I could do a whole presentation on that project um, because there's so many lovely parts to it. Uh, so let, let's talk a little bit about um, ways that you can create a look for autumn containers. For plant material, I'm looking for things that are tolerant of cool temperatures and showcase our local fall colors. So things like grasses and ornamental kale and cabbage. I look for late blooming perennials that are cool temperature tolerant, like this sedum, which is autumn joy. I use that a lot. I love, I love what this plant looks like when it um, begins to flower. It has almost a chartreuse bud. And then as the season progresses, it becomes darker and darker. And even the seed heads are gorgeous on this. Um, this is uh, also, there's some coleus in here and grasses, grasses, grasses. So many gorgeous grasses on the market these days. This is another early fall container. Again, that, um, that leaf uh, and stem of the, of the um, chard in the back, I think just ties the whole thing together with those hints of, of uh, salmon and orange and yellow. This one again is early container after um, this salvia and uh, the, the salmon colored salvia and coleus get nipped by the frost. We'll replace them with grasses or snapdragons, um, but the chard will continue to perform 
uh, until we replant the whole container for a winter arrangement. One of my favorite plants for um, container spillers is this Creeping Jenny or um, it, I have them, I have it planted in many containers and it just stays there from year to year. You gotta be kind of careful about planting that in the garden uh, because it's, it can be aggressive, although it's easy to remove, but it can, can kind of take over a spot if you're, if you're not okay with that happening or you don't have a contained space. But that's a nice way to have consistency from season to season and things that come back. And I love that chartreuse color. I'm also in love with chartreuse. Um, and heirloom pumpkins and gourds. So many gorgeous, uh, gorgeous things on the market right now. The Long Island cheese pumpkin, the Cinderella pumpkins, the turban squash pumpkins, the um, pink ones, the blue ones, the white ones, the speckled ones, the warty ones, they're just stunning. This is a picture um, of, of our before, we're getting ready to load these up to go to a job site. Um, simple arrangement trick is to stack three or more of these flat pumpkins with different colors and features and put little tufts of straw between the layers. Marty, is that <laughs> just for interest or is that to keep it from rotting or? It's really just for interest, although it may help with the rotting a little bit because it'll give us a bit of space between them, just some air space. Um, but I mostly just do it for interest. I find these heirloom pumpkins are pretty durable in terms of uh, staying out in the weather. If you can keep them out of the sunshine when it's warm, then mine last. I mean, I've had some of these white ones that I actually continue to use through uh, the holidays, meaning past Thanksgiving through the new year, Christmas and the new year. Oop. Too fast. Hold on. Going in the wrong direction. Marty. Yeah. I'm thinking that people would love it, and you have been doing this a little bit, but so many of these combinations are so gorgeous. I feel like people are probably wondering what the recipe is. If you feel well, like you have time to share that. Well, sure. So I don't really have a recipe. Um, I usually will start with um, deciding whether or not I want to include evergreens or, um, or annuals, a combination of those things, deciduous plants. And, um, and I'm going to talk just a wee bit about that at the end, but maybe during the talk, I can say more about um, what the actual plant material is in each of these compositions. Like this is a, I believe this is red Russian kale. It's also an edible. And um, that grass, I don't know, Ruth, do you know what that grass is? I think that's an Everillo grass. Um, it looks like that or some kind of a forest maybe. Yeah. Um, again, the Angelita sedum and ornamental um, ornamental peppers in the corner. So I try to get a balance of, uh, of um, things, interest from the leaf and the, the uh, flowers so that I'm not just relying on flowers for the color, but um, you, can, you can really extend the season by using really colorful leaves and thing in things like the the kale and this one has um parsley in it parsley and pansies and chard i love tiarella and heuchera and they make lovely spillers in containers. And you can nestle a little mini pumpkin in there for a pop of autumn color. And heuchers and uh, TRLs, mostly heuchers, come in such a variety of colors. 
even though this, and I'm, I'm, I don't know how to use my pointer, but the, the, um, the plant at the bottom with the veined leaves, that's the heuchera. And um, so there's, uh, there are peach colored ones. There are almost black colored ones. And most of them really are pretty good evergreen performers too. So they're excellent choices for cooler season containers. And I love form and texture. And, and this is a, a good example of pulling a lot of different shapes and colors and, and um, feels of, of the leaf together. Uh, containers are such a great way to play with design elements on a small scale. So notice the spent flower heads of the sedum here, the seed pods of the grass, uh, the velvety texture of the, of the lamb's ear and the repetition of the leaves there in the ajuga. This is another early fall container with grasses and Rudbeckia, Salvia, Coleus, and a different kind of, of Lysimachia, which is what Creeping Jenny is, uh, that wonderful yellow at the corner, which as the season went on, that really draped down and softened the, the edges of this container so beautifully. Um, love winter berries. This is a native, holly that comes in a number of different colors, red, orange, and yellow. And I love the native dogwoods that also come in similar colors. I use a lot of variegated ivy as uh, spillers and that's another excellent staple that really spans all the seasons. But again, a word of caution here because it, it is invasive and because of that invasive nature, I wouldn't plant this in the ground or allow it to mature to seed, but it's a great container plant. Last year, I experimented with some faux berries that were made for outdoors and provided some nice longevity um, of, of the berries through the winter because those, those winter berries will be eaten by the end of the season uh, by the birds. My favorite color combination is purple and chartreuse. And I'm always looking for ways to get that pair in flowers and leaves and twigs. Again, a nice collection of foliage and blooms here. The, the Angelina sedum. I, I probably have an Angelina sedum in 90% of my containers. I'm gonna love this variegated ajuga. Here's a glimpse into another project. This uh, is a, a home where a uh, homeowner asked for a, a more welcoming interest and um, some softening of the lines of the house and the stonework. So we added two containers. Here's their winter arrangement. And this is a uh, uh, sweet flag grass and, um, and the rest of the greenery here is, well, there's a little Angelina seeding, but the rest of the greenery is cut greenery and um, curly willow and red winter berries. That's gorgeous. Mm -hmm. Another photo of it. So um, the, when I'm putting plants in a garden um, for, for a garden design, not a container, I am thinking about what could be cut from this plant collection and brought in for flower arrangements or greenery arrangements or use as a cut material in a container like this. So if you plant with that in mind, you can um, include some evergreens with variegation, some um, camisiparis that um, has yellow foliage, 
some junipers with blue foliage and berries and um, things that are gonna give you the interest uh, in, in twigs and cones and dried, um, dried options for, for your arrangements. And you can see we have pine cones stuck in this particular composition. And um, we just, I think we just pulled those, um, put those in with uh, wrapping floral wire around, around the bottom of them and then sticking them in with a pin. But it's fun to kind of forage through your property to see what you can bring in or um, add to containers. So ideas for winter. Again, the, the evergreen branches and the berries. I'm looking for things that are gonna last past the holiday season to provide interest into the winter. This particular container looked gorgeous March 15th. So we planted it um, right, after, uh, right after Thanksgiving. And um, this, the homeowner kept it, it watered because that will extend the life of your cut greens considerably. It, and if you're doing uh, planted material, it's especially important to keep this watered really well through the winter. Uh, particularly before uh, the, the temperatures drop. It makes it a lot easier on the plants. M Marty, there's a question. What kind of greens were those? Here? Yes. The, the bottom is um, golden mop, camisipris golden mop. And the, there's some grasses in there. I don't know what that grass is. It's variegated carex. I think it's an Everillo um, grass and variegated ivy. And the, um, the, uh, the top greenery is Fraser fir and yellow twig dogwoods and red winter berries. And there was a question, where can they get that? We do at Rings Creek Nursery sell um, greenery when the hot problem starting about the week before Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. But of course you can forage around your yard like Marty mentioned or your neighbor's yard if they don't mind. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and you all carry a lot of these plants um, as potted container plants so that folks can sort of begin to plan their own garden so they have these materials to, to use. This is um, just a, a, a collection of, of curly willow, of um, blue cypress, berries. One of my favorite new discoveries is um, this fantail willow, uh, which has these wonderful little white catkins on distorted stems. This is a, ye a yellow curly willow. Again, the native winter berries in, in multiple colors. I also love Harry Lauder's walking stick. Um, there are lots of different kind of willows uh, as well that make really gorgeous accents or focal points. This is a similar design combination to the one that um, the question was asked about, except for the branching is early willow. When Easy trick is to get uh, your, your base evergreen and then add some interesting plant material around the, um, the bottom. And here I've, I've added um, a dwarf camisipris. So you can, you can put either young evergreens that you would only leave in your container a season or two and then plant into your garden because they're going to continue to grow to the size that they want to be. Um, or you can get 
gorgeous dwarf evergreens. There are so many lovely things right now available. And, um, and those I've left in for, for several years. Um, but this is uh, black Mondo grass. And um, I think this, this little Camocyprus is called something like little Frankie or some, it's got a- uh, um, Frankie boy. Frankie boy, thank you. Um, but I love, I love that texture, those, that elongated um, structure is just so lovely. And then um, a variegated, um, I believe that's a Pieris in the back, uh, back of the photograph. And then with some twigs. So you can trade that out in um, the spring. You could pull out some of those things that seem a little more winter-like and add, um, petunias or calabricoa or something that's going to give you a little bit more of a summer accent. Sometimes simplicity is the best solution. Uh, this is um, a classic container. I love the shape and the shiny finish um, of this of this con uh, blue container and the, the interesting texture of this camisiparis, it's just very basic, um, but stunning. I think the proportions are just really nice on that. Again, sometimes simplicity is the best answer. Love sedum hanging over the edge. I believe this one is red dragon. Does that sound right, Ruth? Red dragon, I think that's. I'm not sure, John Creech. I'm not uh, sure. I'm sorry. I think it's Red Dragon, but there are lots of you know many colors you can you can uh, use in the sedum because uh, it it they're blues, they're yellows, they're reds, they're greens. I love sedum. One of my favorite plants. It's another shot, I think, of the Frankie Boy composition. You put some um, uh, uh, winter, not winter berries, wintergreen um, for those wonderful red berries. I try to, I try to make relationships uh, between the colors of one plant and another and look for the, the continuity of, uh, of something within the leaves or the berries. For this composition, I love how there's just a tiny little hint of red in the, the branching of that uh, Pieris, the variegated Pieris, which picks up the red and the berries. This is an arrangement for someone who asked that we do winter containers that don't look like Christmas. So we went with a, a yellow earthy theme. Um, question about the branches, mm -hmm. that, um, they're cut branches, correct? The branches like the red twig dogwood and- Those are all cut, yes. Um, that's one plant that I wouldn't suggest putting in a container as a planting because it takes up valuable real estate with its root system and it really doesn't help you in terms of how the container looks to have those twigs either cut. It, it makes no difference whether you've got them cut and stuck in there or you actually have the plant. So I'd say grow those in your garden, the red twig dogwoods um, and the winter berries and cut them and then use your root space for other things in the container. My mother makes my front door wreath every year. And I just, I threw this in because I love her compositions and I always get inspirations from her about evergreen options, magnolia and, um, and the dried hydrangeas. A lot of this can translate into containers.
this one has one of my favorite grasses, the blue in the middle. It's a native grass, a carex called uh, blue, uh, bunny blue. And it's an evergreen. And I use it a lot at gardens as well as containers. Here's an example that contains the fantail willow. This is a client who has uh, a bit of a hybrid uh, style in her garden of Asian influence and, and cottage. So these fa fantail willows add just a little bit, I think of an Asian hint to her containers. Marty, what was that um, plant two slides back that was right in the corner, variegated? Right here? That one. What's that sort mm -hmm. of red that and is, green and cream? Uh, that is Lakothoe. And I, I believe that it's called Rainbow, maybe. Gerard's Rainbow, maybe? Yeah. Say it again. Maybe Gerard's Rainbow. I'm not sure. I can't remember the exact variety, but it is something rainbow, I'm pretty sure, Lakothoe. I also use Scarletta Lakothoe a fair amount because I love the, um, the mauve colored leaves of that one. And are those cut or are those planted? Uh, those are planted. Okay. In this case, we, we would, um, move those to into, into the garden at the end of the season. This is taken from my, my office window, so that's why it's very blurry, but I just wanna say you can, you can really speak to nature in containers. Um, and this is a little bird, I wish I knew what kind of bird it is but eating the winter berries from the container outside my office window. So keep in mind when you're planting that you can plant for butterflies in the summer and you, know, you can plant for birds in the winter and pollinators. So another project, this, uh, this patio was completely open and uh, we added these containers to make a wall, sort of like in the first project that we talked about. So we created a, a seating area with beautiful grasses. A, this is um, a little blue stem. They do very nicely in containers. So again, the result was another little, a little room that the owner did not have before we surrounded it with containers. So back to Ruth's question about selecting plant material, things to consider, first and foremost, what, what are the conditions of your site? Is it a sunny site or a shady site? You wanna, you wanna if you're planting material, live material, you wanna make sure that you've matched your light needs with the, with the conditions. And there are different kinds of light too. Morning sun is softer and the afternoon sun is, is harsher. And you might think that that's only an issue when the weather is hot, but actually when the weather is cold, it can be even more of an issue for containers because if something is not going to tolerate, um, you know, the, the quick shift from a cold temperature at night to a really hot sunny temperature, if it's getting direct sun in the day, um, you, you just, you want to just be careful of what, what you're putting into those varying conditions. And think about if it's, if it's a windy site, uh, if it's a site that gets 
a lot of traffic and, and animals or folks brushing up against it? Are there weight restrictions on a balcony or a patio, for example? Um, and when you're, when you're choosing the, um, the container for your project, think about what kind of plant you want to put in it. Um, and if, if you have something that's got a high sheen container, if you've got something that's going to be colorful or is going to be um, more muted, uh, and is it going to be modern? Is it going to be more of a cottage style? So the more you can make those, make the plant material relate to the container, the better they look. You, um, you know, do you want to stick to one color? Do you want to have lots of different, um, different varieties of, of things? Or do you want something like this example, which is just a very simple, clean, kind of modern, modern look? Um, Marty, excuse me, there's a question. Mm -hmm. What are, is the plant material in this picture? This in the containers. This is the um, native winter bear uh, inkberry, Ilex glabra. I'm I'm pretty sure that this is shamrock variety. There are so many wonderful inkberries right now. Uh, we're using these a lot in place of boxwoods, uh, just for uh, more more disease resistance, and they have been. They grow in the wild as very large kind of leggy lanky plants, but they have been bred to be almost dead ringers for boxwood. And, and now they have some out that are, are more dwarf than this. Gem box is one of them. Um, and so I'm really excited for the new introductions uh, to give us some more, more options of how to use this plant. It has a wonderful berry on it as well. You don't, it's not super obvious, but it's a blackberry. When you're, when you're thinking about plants, I, I would encourage you to look in every section of the nursery for, for possibilities. Uh, look for annuals, for perennials, for grasses, for natives, for ground covers, deciduous shrubs and, and evergreens, uh, even small stature trees. Um, let's see, go. one more, one more project. This was uh, a house that needed some softening and some year round color. So simple project. We got two, these actually came from Reams Creek yard too. Got two of these that we put on, um, on this column. And then we, um, we planted it with simple evergreen, a dwarf evergreen. So this one can stay in there for a long time and grasses and pansies and ivy. Couple, um, well, a few thoughts on choosing your container what kind of container uh, do you want in terms of style? Do you want window boxes? Do you want something that's freestanding? How, how big should it be? Do you want it with squared edges or rounded edges, tall or short? Does it need to be lightweight? There are some gorgeous fiberglass containers available now. And um, they're really nice if you think you're going to have um, a weight, if you're going to have a weight restriction, or if you think you're going to want to move them around your garden or to a new home, those are great investments. Um, if you have, if you leave your containers outdoors in the winter, you want to make sure you're buying them that are at a minimum frost resistant, if not frost proof. And you want to make sure that you have it elevated with, um, with room for, for drainage out the bottom. So with pot feet um, or, or some uh, stones to get the, the, uh, the bottom of the pot off the ground. And you wanna make sure you have a drainage hole. 
Marty, there's a question. Do you, mm -hmm. uh, you have to be concerned about the evergreens in the winter time? Mm -hmm. That's hot. Mm -hmm. So I choose plants that are hardy at least a zone colder when I'm thinking about container uh, evergreens. So that means we're in zone seven. So you wanna look for something that is gonna be hardy to at a minimum six or, um, or colder. So things that are gonna thrive in uh, New England are probably gonna do fine in your, in your container. Don't put something in there that's marginally hardy. And um, the soil is really important. You want something that drains appropriately and uh, I use Fawford container mix, which you can get at Reams Creek. I think this having, uh, I think the biggest problem with winter evergreens uh, is wet, get, staying wet in these containers without proper drainage and, and, and um, good soil. I have also lined containers with bubble wrap on the inside. If I'm especially worried about protecting the roots, you can just uh, put it basically in the interior of the pot and then fill your soil. And um, that gives an added layer of insulation. I'm, I'm a very, um, I'm a very kind of uh, <laughs> results driven gardener in the sense of I don't tend to try things that are super new on the market or that um, may work and may not, but I try, I try to stick with things that are very tried and true and I know what they're gonna do. So um, that's the same for my containers. I kind of have a, a list of things that I, that I know work in containers and I just go back to them over and over and put them together differently so they have, um, you know, some interest from one project to the next, but um, I don't, I don't tend to put things in containers where they may or may not make it. Not to say that you can't, because if, if you just love, you know, for example, there's an Elysium that I absolutely love, um, Florida Sunshine. It's a great plant for shade. It has this amazing chartreuse leaf with a red stem. I'd love to be able to use that in containers, but it's it's marginally, I mean, it, it does fine in the ground here, but um, I, I just don't think it would tolerate the cold. Did that answer the, what was the question, Ruth? <laughs> Sorry. I think it was just, will the evergreens make it through the winter in the pot? Yeah. 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 So choose wisely. Many will, but some won't. So, um, other questions or comments? Okay, Marty, we do have questions, definitely. Okay. 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 So let me check into this list here. And maybe before um, we get into the questions, I would just, in case some of you drift off as we go along, um, I want to say uh, we do have a survey that we will send you if you would like to put your email in the chat box we will send that survey to you about evaluating this particular um, workshop but also any ideas you may have for future workshops and if you do we'll send you a coupon if you complete it and um, just in case you drift off uh, I do want to say thank you to all of you for attending and thank you very much to Marty for presenting today. We really appreciate it, Marty. And um, so I'm going to get right to the questions right now. Let me check in this chat box and see. Some of them have been answered along the way, but some haven't. So, um, okay, the sedum with the Ilex Glabra was Angelina. We did answer that. Mm -hmm. um, what materials are the best winter containers made out of ones that won't freeze? Mm -hmm. Do you feel like you've already answered that or? Um, well, I can speak more to the material. Um, 
I prefer fiberglass uh, if you're wanting to be assured that they're going to last. Uh, there are some great uh, um, ceramic containers that are frost uh, frost resistant, but um, honestly, I have like this one in the picture, which came from Reams Creek. Um, I've I have had this brand of containers in my garden for years. I've never had them crack. Um, so part, part of it is the material of the container and part of it is how you plan it and making sure you have that drainage hole and that you have it up off the ground so that it doesn't freeze to the ground. And you kind of get what you pay for. Um, you know, there, there's some there's some lovely things that you can pick up in big box stores, but you're probably not looking at things that are going to last you very long. Lovely meaning like they're, they're beautiful, but they, they may not be, um, you know, they may not be frost resistant even for more than a season or two. Do you recommend using pot feed? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, and, and um, there are lots of different pot feet you can use. You can get really gorgeous ornamental ones that have beautiful balls on the end that match your container. You can also get really simple um, rubber lifters. We use these a lot. You don't even see them. They're like little round. Where would you get those? I order them off of Amazon. I can't think of the I can't think of the brand of what it is, but I think you could just or you could Google pot pot feet um, rubber pot feet. Okay. So next question: Can you buy chard this time of year, or do you plant seed? Um, well, Ruth can probably answer that. But I, if you plant seed, it's probably not going to do much before the end of the season. Um, yeah. So I would agree, and I think our supply of chard at this point is somewhat limited, yeah. if, if there is any. It, this brings me to another a thought about buying sizes, uh, because while it's great that you can create this instant garden for yourself, if you put, if you install everything and they're tiny little plants, it's, it may be that it takes so long for your plants combination to grow in that you've now gone, you've made it to the next season. So when I'm planting for container uh, gardens, I am trying to get the most mature thing that I can find. And um, it's, it's sometimes a tricky balance because I'm looking for certain colors and textures and um, things that are going to match the conditions. And it's, especially this year, we've had uh, I mean, gardening has been really popular this year, so it's been a little harder to get my hands on some of the plant material. But if you can buy a one gallon annual versus a four inch pot, I would get the one gallon so you get that instant fill. So kind of the same thing with the chard. Like I, if I was gonna put chard in a container, I would wanna find the biggest, the most matured chard I could get a hold of. Okay, this is just a comment from Janet. If you don't mind me sharing that I've, what I've done with my pumpkin stacks, like that is sponge them with 10% bleach solution when I put them out. They normally last through the winter. And so what I do after is um, spray paint them white, stack them again and dress them up like snowmen. I even have a scarf and a hat and everything that I use. Love that's, that. That's a fun idea. That's a great idea and a great tip. I don't, I'm sorry. I don't know. Um, I haven't tried the wiping down with bleach, but I have heard other people mention that. But I love the, the I love the snowman idea. There's a, um, there's someone I know who paints theirs red and puts like a, um, an, an aluminum foil uh, piece that's crafted for the top of a Christmas tree ball. <clears throat> awesome. So the, the next question, 
this is kind of a tricky question. I'm not sure if you're going to have time to answer this. And it's anyway, what plant materials are poisonous to dogs and cats? Because that could be a very long list. You may need to yeah. go somewhere like, I think, is it AS? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> ASPA has a list like that. Mm -hmm. Yes, they do. Um, and so if someone tells me that they don't want plant material that's poison, I mean, so much plant material is poison. I mean, meaning that if you eat it, you're probably gonna not feel well. Um, not so much, you know, a serious reaction, but I will try to figure out why they're asking for it. It sounds like this person's asking for, for um, pets and then look at the, um, at the, um, the site or Google what, what, it, what are the plants you should plant if you want to, if you're concerned about it. So it's then there was a, a question about the greens, cut greens, which we already answered. And then another question about, do we sell golden mops greens at Reams Creek. We do sell the bushes and we try to sell the greens. We do, can um, run out of that particular green, but we're always looking for it. Mm -hmm. um, it actually at, is a great winter accent. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, you can see that I love it because it, it shows up in a lot of these photographs. Um, Marty, you may have answered this. What plants might live through winter planted in containers? Um, I'm trying to think if there are other things that I haven't spoken to that are my favorite or on my favorites list. I think I've pretty much hit them all. You know, grab, the grasses, the yellow grasses, the black grasses. Oh, here's one, uh, hellebores. I, those are a gorgeous flower uh, and, and tend to do really well in winter containers. And you can have hellebores blooming from early December all the way through to early spring. Not the same hellebore, but, but they come uh, in a lot of different bloom cycles. And, and y'all, hellebores are also called Lenten rose. Yes, sorry. Uh, here's a great question from Gary. Do you think it best to have all containers in a yard to be a similar color, or do you mix? And if so, what is suggested color palette? Mm, that is a good question. It's just personal preference, really. It depends on the style you're going for. These, uh, the containers that were, in um, in that enclosure, let's see this this enclosure. This is uh, probably eight different containers here that we butted up together. And here I wanted something with very clean lines and um, and the consistency. But if you're looking for something that's more of a cottage look or more of sort of a look of whimsy or an artistic look, then mixing and matching is um, super fun. And in my own garden, I have a little bit of each uh, places where things uh, tend, where things read as very similar, even if they're different container materials they have a similar color or they have a similar shape, some relationship to one another. And then I have, you know, I just, I, I think it's just personal preference. My favorite color in the garden is this one in a container. Um, this blue. And I installed these, these are uh, ceramic containers but I also install them as fiberglass ones that are, you can't tell uh, what, that they're, th these are all fiberglass. And you cannot tell if this is lead or if this is aged copper. Um, 
until you touch it. It's the finish on it is pretty incredible. So it's just, I think anything goes really. So that blue color, this is a personal question. You, do you feel like that just goes with a lot of things? It goes with so many things. I love it in front of brick and I love it in front of stone and I love it in with grass. Yes, it's very versatile. So it's a way you can get a pop of color, but it still is a bit neutral. That's great. So what the next thing is, what are the tall yellow branches, which that's, I'm just gonna say that's yellow twig dogwood. Yep. And are all of these for outdoor only? All of what? These, I guess the branches. Or maybe oh, oh, I bring those. Oh, no, I bring those in. All of these that we've talked about, the branches, the evergreens, um, hellebores, the leaves of the heuchera, I use them all winter long to make indoor arrangements. Any idea if the magnolia branches would last in zone five to six? magnolia um, cuttings or, or uh, planted material? It doesn't exactly say so. Um... Well, I, I only use cut magnolia in containers and um, I love the fuzzy brown underside of those leaves. I love the waxiness of the leaves and the size of them. They're just gorgeous. They don't last all season. And so um, it's, it's a trade off when those get installed because it, it means that, you know, they might look brown and crinkly by the time February comes. But I don't mind that. Some people do. Some people want them to look green and they're just harder to keep uh, fresh. Things that are easiest to keep fresh as a cut material uh, is going to be junipers, the camisiparis, um, the the Fraser firs, and uh, the cypress. What is the median inside the container for cut plants aside from water? What is the medium? Like what is? I think they may mean like the pot. Is it, what's it in? in the the soil? soil. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we. Uh, don't take the soil out for the winter. If we have a container that was planted for the fall season, we would remove the dead material by just cutting it off and not uh, pulling out the roots because those roots actually make a great, almost like a frog, if you will, for inserting the greenery. So just leave your soil in there and put the greenery into the soil. Okay, I think you might have already answered this, the variegated leaf and the Asian arrangement. I think that was the like mm -hmm. way or dog hobble. Yep, yep. Um, are your mother's wreaths freshly cut materials? <laughs> <laughs> Mom's wreaths are freshly cut materials. She cuts a lot from my garden and um, yeah, I, I'm just trying to think, I don't think there's anything in this that is, no, they're all fresh. And I think your mom may be with us today. We're, I'm not sure, I haven't seen I her hope she is. My, yeah. son, <laughs> my son was trying to help her get on, so I hope she is. Yeah, so she, for, she forages for these type of things all the time. And um, in fact, she has a little collection at my house where um, she's gotten in the hydrangeas and we're drying those and, um, and dried ferns and, and twigs and that sort of thing that she adds to the fresh greenery. I tell her she should start her own business. It's beautiful. It is. All right. Where do you source your fiberglass tall, narrow pots? Fiberglass tall, narrow pots. So my fiberglass containers are by Capital Products um, out of England. And, um, and I just, I order them directly from Capital. Uh, the tall one, 
I'm trying to think what tall one that would be. Uh, thinking maybe it's the ones that are the ones that were circling the patios. Yes. I'm not yeah. sure, but. Or maybe the, oh, maybe the one in this project, because that does look kind of tall. Yes. Those are capital products. And, and they do an incredible job of creating just stunning pieces of, um, of art, really. They're beautiful. And they're, they last for decades. Like you'll, you'll give them to your children. What herbs do well inside for winter? Herbs? Mm. Inside for winter. I've never had great luck of growing herbs in the in the winter. What Ruth, how would you answer that? I mean, I I've I I don't have great luck either. I used to bring my rosemary in and it would always die. I think I either underwatered it or overwatered it. Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of herbs, parsley and rosemary and even cilantro and dill to a degree, um, sage are going to um, be, you could be growing them in your yard. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. So Man. I haven't had much luck with stuff like basil inside, but um, some people do have luck yeah. with it. I think if you had a really sunny window, you know, a south facing window that and I just don't have, I don't have the space in my home no, to do that. So I can't speak to personal experience. I would say go to the grocery store and get it in the produce section with the roots already on it. <laughs> and know that it's going to last like two weeks. So what advice do you have about watering in cold weather? Mm -hmm. So if it's going to get uh, cold. Before it gets cold, make sure that you have uh, thoroughly watered your plants. And sometimes that means watering them once, letting it soak in a little bit, and then watering them again, it's particularly if they've dried out. These, these soil mixtures, like the Fofford one that I mentioned earlier, they, uh, they do a great job at uh, retaining the moisture uh, of um, but if they dry out, it is hard to rehydrate them. So consistently watering them and, um, and not over watering. And I know that's, it's, it really is, a, it's an art as much as a science to know how much to water things. But if you know that a freeze is coming, if you know, it's going to be a really big cold snap to, to get out there in the middle of the day when hopefully the soil is not frozen and, and really try to hydrate it. Um, do you, when you say that, do you use the container mix in the red bag that has the yeah. crystals in it? Okay. Yep. Okay. Um, so Those crystals I think can be be helpful. Uh, um, Ruth is talking about there's a, a product that will um, basically absorb water when it's wet and then release water when the soil is dry. Those can be helpful, uh, but you have to be careful with them because you do not want to put too much of that in your soil. You have to be real careful about following the instructions. But what I love about Fofford is that that's already sort of measured out for you and I'm a huge fan of that soil. So this is a sort of a thing to me and it was a private one, but I'm going to say if you, um, you would receive your coupon via email and Kathy, you should have gotten one from the last survey. I did send one to everyone who re filled out the survey. Um, sorry if something fell through the cracks there, but you would look, look for it in your email. And this, um, I'm, I might have missed this because it says, what brand is that container in the picture? I'm sorry, Jean, I, I don't know now which picture that was referring to, but maybe Marty's covered that. Um, the, um, the ceramic containers are Pottery Market, which are available at Reams Creek. 
And then from Kim, thanks so much. Lovely designs and ideas. And you've already spoken about where do you source the fiberglass pots. Mm -hmm. um, okay, let's see. Did your mom, what did your mom use as a wreath base? <laughs> so, too bad we can't um, stream. They're her. on, yeah. Yeah, so generally what she does is she buys she buys the Fraser for a wreath, just a plain wreath. And then she ah. embellishes it. And just as an aside, we hope to be having at least two different wreath workshops. We're still trying to figure out how we're gonna do that because of the pandemic, but just keep your, um, ears tuned to our newsletter or check on our website for more information about wreath workshops. Um, Janet comments, if you have a grow light, it's a lot easier to get the herbs to grow indoors and yeah. don't over water them. And then Kathy wants to know, what temperature do you consider cold? <laughs> um, well, like last night it was cold, but I wouldn't have been worried about, I mean, I wouldn't want my, my, um, plants to be dry last night, bone dry. But if it's going to be a hard freeze, if it's going to be cold temperatures, you know, in the 20s and 30s, I would definitely want to want to water them. And then Kim comments, her oregano and chives were outside in the pot all winter, covered with leaf mulch and came back in the spring. And then I had a, um, a question too, is how would you, um, follow up in January after your holiday arrangements. You mean, how, how would we maintain them? How would we go around to clients and just- would, Yeah, would you um, just kind of let it keep, die out or would mm -hmm. you actually do a new arrangement? Um, we rarely do new arrangements, although have a time or two, but I try to design them so that the material is going to look uh, reasonable uh, well into February. And uh, the client will often, if something dies, pull, you know, pull it out. And we, we plant them so lushly, so thickly that if you have to pull out a few pieces that are dead and you don't like the look of, then you've got still other uh, you know, a, a solid base there for um, for the rest of the season. So it's it mostly lasts till after you know, well after the new year. It, it does make people very excited for spring plantings, though, for the spring refreshes. <laughs> yeah. Um, so then Kathy said, thanks so much. I'm from way up north where we can't winter garden at all. I'm going to ask you, I feel like zone six is what we are here. I mean, we're really zone seven, but mm -hmm. a lot of the um, New England is zone six. Would you, do you think, Marty, or no? Wait, what's the question? I guess she's just saying she can't winter garden up, up north at all, but um, I mean, maybe if she's in Minnesota, but New England has a similar um, zone as we do because we're in the mountains. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I guess maybe I was thinking about, you know, the, cold, the coldest places uh, in New England. My, my guidance would just be to make sure that you're you're planting things that are no, uh, you know, are, are going to tolerate at, at least zone six in terms of cold weather. And it also, I mean, these zones are uh, a bit, um, they're a bit flexible in the sense of it's true, like your elevation makes a big difference. I've got microclimates here in my own, you know, quarter of an acre that one one part can tolerate things that others that another part can't 
or if you live like up on Reynolds Mountain and you've got the wind to deal with and you've also got some elevation change there. So you have to you have to look at each circumstance as an individual circumstance and think about all the different variables. The zone is only one of them. So if you could name like four go-to sun container plants, your mm -hmm. favorites and four go-to shade container plants, what would those be? Mm -hmm. So my sun go-to's would be um, the uh, the ink berries, the camisipris, the golden mop, the angelina sedum, and a juga. Gosh, it's hard to be asked to only name four. Um, okay, so I'm just right off the top of my head thinking, okay, what do I put in those conditions? Um, shade, the uh, black mondo grass, the heucheras and the tiarellas, pieris, and the um, the uh, variegated ivy. Thank you. And then, do you have a formula with, that you think about when you're creating a container garden? I really, you know, there are. There are formulas like the the filler, thriller, and spiller, and the I mean they're 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 kind of um, there are ways to think about it, but I don't do it as a formula. I know other designers that stick more to a formula. Uh, I usually will choose the the main ingredient first, whether that's going to be an evergreen or it's going to be a deciduous shrub or it's gonna be a really um, a, a large annual or perennial and then build from there and think about blending the colors and the textures. And, and I, I approach it really in a similar way to approaching a design project in the garden. I'm, I'm looking for some repetition, um, some, some nice forms and, um, and colors and I don't have a formula. Okay, we've got one last question from Sally. How to deal with replacement, like as in seasonal replacement planting when the soil is frozen in February? Yeah, that's hard to do. <laughs> My colleagues in um, Northern areas like Chicago, I mean, they, they're doing their winter plantings before Thanksgiving because the soil's gonna freeze in the containers. So, and once that happens, you're kinda, you know, you're kinda out of luck. You can, you can force the, the twigs in there for some interest, but I think trying to remove the roots in those frozen conditions is, I mean, you might could take a hair dryer or something, try to do it, but I wouldn't bother with that. I would just wait till it unfroze. Okay. Well, Marty, I just want to thank you so much. This has been so inspirational, all these gorgeous containers. And I also want to thank all of you for attending today. It's just wonderful having you with us. And um, do you have anything else you'd like to add before we say goodbye, Marty? It's been such a delight. Uh, I can, I laughed with Ruth, Ruth yesterday. My husband says I could talk the horns off a bull about gardens. So I, I love the chance to sit with like-minded folks and um, share and love, love those of you who shared your ideas with me. And um, I'm just very grateful for the chance to be with you this morning. And you can, you can check out my other work on my website. It's easy to find. It's Gardens by Marty and you spell my name, M-A-R-D-I. And I have a newsletter that I try to keep up with. And if you're interested in being on that list, you can sign up on my website. So I'd love to have you join that. Thank you, Marty. And you just got a slew of wonderful comments and thank yous, which I'll share with you in a minute. And um, Thanks again to everyone for coming today and thanks again, Marty.
Lesson. My pleasure. Bye. Bye.